Oh, 
On the way back to Indiana last week, my wife and I had the privilege to travel through a small town in Iowa called West Branch. Ranch Branch, Iowa is the birthplace of one of the presidents of our United States, the president that was the president of the United States when my mother was born, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover was born in 1874. Let's call that 150 years ago. He was the first of three children. He was orphaned, lost both of his parents by the time he was 11. He grew up in the house that Sherry and I got to see that I would say was from this privacy railing to that block wall to this wall to here. Two-room house. Still open to the public. You walk in and you turn to the right and there was the living room for five people. No bigger than this space. And you turn to the left and there was the bedroom for all five of the family. You walk out into the back porch and there was the kitchen, a room no bigger than this, and then another 20 feet towards the backyard was the outhouse. I'm imagining myself in 1880, West Branch, Kansas, in the middle of February, thinking, man, how did they survive those rugged winters of Iowa in this little bitty shelter? It was towards the end of Herbert Huber's life. He lived until 1964, made it 90 years. President, did a lot of great things over his life, and he wrote this. And it's on the memorial on the museum that is also there on the ground. It says, my country owes me no debt. It gave me, as it gives every boy and girl, a chance. It gave me schooling, independence of action, opportunity for service, and honor. In no other land could a boy from a country village that was smaller than the size of Chesterfield, without inheritance or influential friends, look forward with unbounded hope. Here it is 150 years later. We complain it's too hot in the summertime, it's too cold in the wintertime. Our bed may have a little pedal in the wrong place, or maybe our indoor plumbing isn't working correctly, or uh, you know, maybe we get a flat tire on our car, and it's the end of the world. And I sometimes think that in this century and in this time, we so often forget how easy we have it compared to our forefathers and our foremothers, who dealt with the harsh elements of the world in which we live, who did most of the work with these things, and this, and the rest of this, in order to survive, not just to be comfortable. And I wonder where the wisdom of our past has gone. It was while I was traveling and trying to catch up on what was going on in today's world that I started to hear these newer terms that are coming out of uh, universities and scholarship, things like social construct, that our gender is simply a social construct, that we make it up and we assign these 
constructs to people. And I'm thinking to myself, no, that's, that's wisdom based on tradition and experience. We know what biology says in our world. And yet we make up this new term to justify our identities or our behaviors. And it makes me ask the same question that James asked almost 2,000 years ago. Uh, authors put this in the seventh decade of uh, the common century that, or the common era that we live in now. So some 2,000, 30 years ago, who is wise and understanding among us? Where is the premise in today's world to show by your good life that your works are done in gentleness, born of wisdom? When it seems that today's world is all about who can argue the loudest or be the meanest or say the nastiest things on social media posts. And James reminds us that if we are all about bitter envy of what everyone else has and we don't, or about selfish ambition about what we want and put it ahead of everything else, then we're not living the truth. And then James confronts us with the harsh statement that if that is our motivations in our life, then the wisdom that governs our decision is not from above, but rather from right here on earth. Has nothing to do with our spirit, and in fact, he even attributed it to evil, calling it devilish. And especially in politics, we see a lot of selfish ambition. A lot of falsehoods and much bitter envy. I mean, heck, we've had one candidate that his life has been tried to have been taken from him twice already this summer. Bitter envy, hatred, selfishness. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is also disorder and wickedness of every kind. Has this not been fulfilled, brothers and sisters? <clears throat> we have all kinds of issues and problems in today's world. Yeah. Because so many humans are motivated by their own ambition and by their envy of what everybody else has. But instead of leaving us with that quagmire and problem, James gives us the answer or the contradictory way, God's way. The wisdom that is from above is at first pure, not double-minded, not in conflict. Its sole motivation and reason is to serve God. And then it's peaceable. Not trying to put our way above everyone else. Not trying to be right. Peaceable. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Where are the peacemakers in today's world? Gentle. Not mean. Not condescending. Not talking down to our fellows and brothers and sisters but gentle, even willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. You know, in today's world, there seems to be this great desire that we have to be right. And yet Jesus didn't take that attitude with his life. Even when he run into such individuals, he was willing to yield in the sense that he wasn't going to fight with them. He wasn't going to argue with them. He is like, okay, 
Here's the truth. Take it or leave it. And moved on. And in today's world, we see all this infighting amongst each other, even amongst families. Because they have to be right. And it's got to be their way or the highway. And that is selfish. And that's an inability to yield. And that is earthly wisdom, brothers and sisters, not heaven. And he says that a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Not war, but make peace. Who try to get along. Who try to live the truth and to show that truth to others. And so if that's not enough for us to get it and to understand what choices we're going to make in our lives, how those choices affect our life, he gives us examples. Those conflicts and disputes among us, where do they come from, he asked. As I've gotten older, I have really gotten more conscious of God's ability to give us freedom of choice and how those choices not only affect our lives, but affect the lives of others. And we make a million choices a day, and I think we don't pay attention to how those choices affect the world in which we live, but they do. Whether it's being rude to some stranger in the grocery store, or flipping somebody the bird that cuts you off on the street, or whether having a discussion on how to get something to accomplish and putting everyone else down because you're the smartest person in the room. Pride. Arrogance. Where do those disputes and conflicts all come from? Well, James says they come from the cravings that are at war within us. Our own choices and decisions. That we choose our way instead of God's way. The way Jesus showed us. The way the Bible teaches us. And we put our arrogance and pride above that of God's. Because we think we know better. And this next verse is it's so it's typical and, and explanatory of today's world. You want something and don't have it, so let's go kill somebody so we can steal their stuff. You covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. Isn't that a great description of today's world? You do not have, he says, because we do not ask, but we ask, but we do not ask right now. We ask wrongly because what we ask God for is something that we can enjoy and for our own personal pleasures. Did you ever hear in any of Jesus' teachings or prayers, God do this for me so that I can enjoy it? I've heard many Christians say, you know, I've often prayed to God, can I hit the lottery? And I've often wanted to ask that person, well, if you did, how much of it would you give to God's church? A lot of our prayers are selfishly motivated. And yet we have the example of God's Son, whose prayers were for everyone else. In fact, they were for all of us. Go to the 16th and 17th chapter and 18th chapter of John's Gospel. And you'll read a prayer that is all about humanity from Jesus Christ. God, may they abide in me so like I abide in you so that they will know you as I know you. And oh, so on and so forth. And it is so contradictory to the prayers that the rest of us say. And James says, do you not know, and if we do, then maybe we need to 
reminded that friendship with the world is being an enemy to God. It was the world that taught me to look out for number one. It was the world that taught me to grab the gusto. It was the world that said, stop over whoever you got to get over to get to be number one and to get to the top. Do what you got to do. Is that what God teaches? And for somehow we go through this life trying to balance these two opposites and justify when we choose the earthly wisdom over the heavenly. And then we complain to each other, the world's falling to pieces. The world's going to that proverbial basket. And what's wrong? And we barely Error, rarely acknowledge our own responsibility in it. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell within us? But he gives all the more grace because he opposes the proud and gives grace to the home. Brothers and sisters, I know I've given you this illustration before, but I can think of no better. When I graduated from Indiana University in 1982, I had the world. I knew, I knew what I was going to do. And I, I was smart. I was educated. I had a piece of paper that told me so. And the world was stupid. It didn't know what it was doing. And I was going to go out and show it the right way, right? And after a decade of knocking my head up against the wall and struggling and finding difficulties, I realized that I didn't know nothing. All the pieces of paper that this earthly world can give me don't even compare. Don't even come close. To the wisdom of God. It dawned on me walking the campus of Indiana University that if I had all the knowledge in all of these buildings, biology, astronomy, law, education, music, if I had it all, I still wouldn't be close to the wisdom of God. And yet in our arrogance and in our pride as human beings, we get these little pieces of paper and think we are the, boy, we're the, we're the thing. We forget how wise our God is. And it was finally after struggling for almost a decade at the age of 31 that I did exactly what this passage described. I submitted I subjected myself to God. I gave up my pride and arrogance and said, God, you're the smart one. I'm the stupid one. And it was then that God blessed and enriched my life upon my wildest imagination. And I don't know how to get across to this prideful generation the blessings that they can receive if they would just let go of their pride and arrogance and let God be their God. Amen. And I see the problems that this younger generation is dealing with and we don't even know how to coach them. We don't even know which direction to point them in. And we blindly go into the future thinking that we know better than him. It's time for the Christian community in this world to ask the question that James asked. Who is truly wise and understanding in this generation? And to really consider fully the ramifications 
of their answer. The church has been on this planet for close to 2,000 years. There's not been a form of government that has lasted that long. There are very few human organizations that can boast of a history of over 2,000 years. And it's not because we humans have been so marvelous at maintaining and supporting the church. It's because God is in behind it. Because if it was left to us humans and our wisdom and our intelligence, we didn't mess this thing up a long time ago. Our whole goal and our whole mission, according to that scripture, is that He should be our vision. He should be our decision maker. We should consult Him on what to do with the issues and the conflicts that face not only us as a church, but also our own personal journey in life. 